Welcome everybody tonight for this really amazing evening uh, with such a special guest tonight. My name is Dr. Diana Londoño. I'm a urologist in Los Angeles, and I'm the founder of physiciancoachsupport.com, which is a free and confidential platform for any physician to come and get support by a peer who is also a physician and a certified life coach. So we want to help in any situation that may be something that they want to speak about, but again, in a confidential manner with a physician. So every month we do meetings with, you know, just amazing physicians that can help us in some way, shape or form, whether to learn new tools, new ideas, techniques that can hopefully help us into our path to wellness. And uh, this, this month is really, really special uh, because of Dr. Evan Alexander, who is here with us tonight. And I want to uh, thank and acknowledge Ramana and your assistant Elizabeth just for their uh, guidance and their help in getting you know, us introduced and just to getting you here tonight. I know you are very busy, you know, very famous and you know, doing such a great impact in this world. So I am very grateful uh, for that and for being here. So I don't wanna take too much time and I'll let you definitely speak to us a lot more, but just a brief introduction for all those that may not be aware of Dr. Alexander's work. He is an academic neurosurgeon with more than you know a few decades of, of work uh, while he was at Harvard Medical School teaching and uh, operating on so many uh, patients and has had you know hundreds of published papers uh, with neurosurgery and obviously his life changed tremendously when he experienced his near-death experience he will uh, share with us tonight in 2008 and how that just transformed his life view. And since then, he has been in multiple media outlets, more than 400 huge media outlets like Oprah, Larry King, 2020, and has been on podcasts and is also the author of three New York Times selling books, which I have two here, which is one is Proof of Heaven. The other one is Map of Heaven. And the third is Living in a Mindful Universe. So if you have not read those, I highly recommend them there very, very insightful and hopeful books. So um, I that's just a quick intro. And just also, if you're not aware, he was just renamed again in 2024, one of the top 100 most influential living uh, spiritual people in the world. So congratulations, Dr. Alexander. Well, thank you so much, Diana. And it's great to be on with you this evening. Well, thank you so much. So could you maybe just bring us to the beginning and uh, share with us, for those that are not aware, you know, how your life changed dramatically in 2008 and what happened? Okay. Well, um, important to point out um, that uh, it's not just the story I told in Proof of Heaven, although there, you know, a lot of this story is there, uh, but the medical details were confirmed by a, a case report that came out in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, September 2008. 18, that was by Dr. Serbi Khanna, Lauren Moore, and Bruce Grayson. And that case report really made two very strong points. One is that based on the Glasgow coma scales and the uh, neurologic exams, CT and MRI scans, lab values, et cetera, my brain was in no shape to harbor any kind of dream or hallucination. That's really an important point to make. And it's one of the reasons why I think my case is of such interest to the scientific community. And then, of course, the other point they made when challenged by the peer review editors of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, how do you explain this case unprecedented in the medical literature to be, you know, weak and deep coma from uh, uh, E. coli, bacterial meningoencephalitis, and then end up having a full recovery. And the explanation from the three authors of the paper, they said it's because he had a near-death experience that he had this miraculous healing. And uh, that's where I think the kind of essence of, of the discussion lies is, what is our power to uh, invoke healing and wholeness uh, in ourselves and in others? You know, all of us as physicians, uh, you know, that's a big question. And that's what I hope to help start answering here with uh, sharing my story. Now, when all this happened to me back in September uh, or November of 2008, uh, I was 54 years old. I had uh, basically been uh, uh, brought up in very much a conventional um, you know, materialist, physicalist, uh, neuroscientific uh, education. That is uh, what a lot of us went through back in the mid and late 20th century, uh, thinking the brain creates consciousness and the physical world is all that exists. 
and uh, what's called promissory materialism, you know, that if we study the brain enough, someday we'll discover how it's related to consciousness. Well, it turns out that all that is a, a pipe dream because the brain does not create consciousness. It serves as a transceiver, a, a filter, a, you know, it allows us to access consciousness, but consciousness itself is not ultimately created by the brain. And this is something we discuss in great detail in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. But I want to share with you what I went through back in November 2008 that changed my mind on all of this. Turns out that um, one of the important features of my near-death experience, uh, uh, and it's something I really haven't heard about in such strong measure in any other such experience, but it was my amnesia, that I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life, you know. That, that was a real shocker when I came back to this world and was trying to make sense of everything. And yet the amnesia <clears throat> was very important in kind of some of the deepest lessons of the NDE. If it had been a more standard uh, near-death experience, for example, if I had uh, scripted this whole thing, my, my adoptive father, who was a, a globally renowned neurosurgeon, head of a training program, very scientific, but also very spiritual. He believed in a loving personal God and the power of prayer. He had been a combat surgeon in the Second World War, and I still have his combat uh, uh, Bible that he had in his uh, shirt pocket during two years serving in the Pacific Theater during World War II. And I think that that is one of the main reasons he came back to this world uh, unscathed for the most part. And as much as I wanted to follow his lead, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, always knowing from the get-go that science was a pathway to truth. But like so many others in our world, I made the mistake of thinking that a... Uh, Kind of Newtonian deterministic materialist science uh, would explain the workings of the brain, which it cannot. The hard problem of consciousness is an impossible problem for materialist neuroscience, and yet we do have ways of moving forward and understanding all this. Now, in the setting of that amnesia, uh, it all started in what I call the earthworm's eye view, very primitive course, unresponsive realm, like being in dirty jello. I had no body awareness, but I did remember feeling things, you know, feeling the environment, smells, sounds, all that stuff was getting in somehow. It wasn't coming in through my ears and eyes and bodily sensory functions, but um, I was aware of things going on around me. And the good news is that earthworm eye view did not last forever. They came, it came as slowly spinning white light with a perfect musical melody. And that's what opened up like a rip in the fabric of that ugly earthworm eye view and led me up into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. Now that's a realm that uh, demands some explanation. That's where we would go through things like life reviews. Uh, and do note that in a life review, you can experience birth, death, everything in between simultaneously. It's a very important point. And when you review uh, near-death experiences and life reviews in large measure, uh, and life reviews are quite common, 25 to 50% of NDEs will have a life review depending on the series. Um, but what you find is that uh, it's like a reliving of events, not just a remembering of events. And not only that, it's from the perspective of all involved. So your life review will involve the perspective of others who were impacted by your actions and thoughts. That's why, you know, in many ways, it's like the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated, is written into the very fabric of the universe through the structure of near-death experiences and this incredible reliving of events from the perspective of all involved. Now, uh, given my amnesia, I could not have an Evan Alexander life review, but I did witness life reviews and... Uh, reincarnation in very strong fashion in two visions as this whole thing progressed. But I want to take you back to that gateway valley uh, and kind of what was going on there and how that progressed into uh, more advanced kind of spiritual levels. Uh, in the gateway valley, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Uh, millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling in vast formations, colors beyond the rainbow. Uh, down below, perfect meadows surrounded by forest and Wa sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools, uh, just incredible. It was a world of ideals. There was no death or decay, kind of a world of perfection. Uh, and yet that is where we would go through life reviews. So in that setting of infinitely loving kind of God force ambience of, uh, of the love of that realm, which is the most outstanding ingredient, uh, when we go through a life review, if elements of our life were too... We were too busy with uh, being greedy and uh, selfish and uh, uh, 
dealing out pain and suffering to others, then in that life review, having to re-experience that from the receiving end, of course, would be no fun. In fact, I think that's where our, our ideas of hell have come from, because to me, it made zero sense that any soul would ever be committed to any kind of eternal damnation in this whole operation, especially um, because of what happened next. In this setting, I saw, um, you know, the as a speck of awareness on the butterfly wing with all this beautiful uh, kind of festivity going on below me. It was being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs, angelic choirs who would emanate chants, anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness. But the, the thing that was most prominent was this beautiful sense of love. And I remember I was not alone on that butterfly wing. And people who've read the book Proof of Heaven will realize there was a beautiful guardian angel, uh, a spiritual guide. I'll never forget her sparkling blue eyes, high forehead, broad uh, smile, uh, high cheekbones. She was dressed in the same kind of simple yet very colorful garb that all the beings dancing down below in the meadow wore. Uh, and I remember she looked at me with this look of pure love and she never said a word, but her mind came directly into mind uh, with a perfect mind meld. And, and I knew her deep truth, which I reported much later in words, weeks later. And the words I used to describe that truth that came from her to me in this, in this journey, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are richly loved. And I cannot tell you how reassuring and affirming and validating that all was. Some of the words I used to describe this may sound foreign to some people, and yet thousands of people contacted me after they read Proof of Heaven and said that much of what I said to them uh, in many ways reminded them of their own kind of deep journey, which they may have even forgotten. It might have had to do with past lives or just events in this life back in early childhood, what have you. Uh, so it was definitely a resonance, and it's something, uh, for me, the word spiritual home really kind of says it all. Uh, you know, these words and everything and hearing of a world that's beyond the flow of, of time, uh, where birth, death, everything in between is experienced simultaneously, it sounds very foreign, and yet it can be very comforting to go through that kind of process, even in my setting with amnesia that prevented an Eben Alexander life review. But what happened next, uh, it explains a lot of that. And that is that those angelic choirs above provided yet another musical portal, uh, a light portal, a wormhole, what have you, going uh, up into higher and higher levels. And I remember seeing all of four-dimensional space-time, that would be our earthly uh, realm and this material realm collapsing down. Then all of that spiritual realm with a completely different ordering of causality that I call deep time or meta time. That's what allows for birth, death, everything in between, even past lives, future lives, to be presented at, on that theater of uh, observation. Uh, and so all of that was going on. And I remember all of that collapsing down until I, I passed up through this portal into what I call the core. The core was an infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with the divine love of that God force. And uh, remember that uh, more than 90% of people who have had near-death experiences going back across all continents, all belief systems, all religions, some atheist, agnostic, what have you, but going through this experience, more than 90% of them come back not only believing in, but knowing the reality of a God force. Now, I will put out there that uh, it's a God of love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness. Uh, and to the extent that any religion follows those basic principles, it's on the right pathway. But no, I realize that that God force, which I came back to this world calling Alm because of the sound I heard in that deepest of uh, sanctum sanctorum of the divine in the core realm, uh, I knew that you could try and define it as God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit. I don't care what words you use. But it's a human fabrication to believe that uh, you know we have that kind of power over determining uh, that force. And when you look at near-death experiences as a large group and study them, as a, a good friend of mine, Robert Kopp, C-O-P-P-E-S, who wrote the book Essence of Religions did, he used near-death experiences as the gold standard. And he compared the three Abrahamic faiths, as well as Hinduism and Buddhism, to the gold standard of NDEs. Uh, and, and 
in that book, Essence of Religions, he goes into a lot of discussion about it. But the upshot is that we need to really learn to live in, with the teaching of the, of the prophets in agreement with that love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance. We're all in this together. And the deep blessing coming out of near-death experiences and what they tell us about the nature of consciousness is that we're all eternal souls and that our existence is multiple incarnations. I saw a uh, reincarnation in, in the a core realm in, in both what I call the flying fish vision, but also more importantly, a uh, more detailed Ender's net vision, which came on a different uh, later passage through the core realm, uh, where I saw life reviews as uh, this course correction mechanism. Uh, we When we die, we reunite with souls of departed loved ones, go through those life reviews, all in the setting of that loving God. It's not a judgmental God but a God that is just pure love at the core. And that's what so many near-death experiences are so comforted by. They come back to this world, not afraid of dying, uh, realizing that in fact, it's an expansion of conscious awareness. And when you, you realize that the brain is only a reducing valve or filter, uh, and that little voice in your head is not your consciousness. I love how uh, Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul calls the voice in your head, your annoying roommate. That gives you a much better perspective of where we're headed in a discussion of consciousness, because consciousness is all about that observer. It's not the little ego mind. And for me, um, uh, ever since I came back from my coma, I've used uh, meditation in the form of sacred acoustics, binaural beat brainwave entrainment, which we can discuss a little more in a few minutes. But uh, I've used it to return to my NDE and uh, not just to re recover memories, uh, but to develop an ongoing, richer relationship with the various entities, denizens of, of that realm, including that infinitely loving God force. Now, it turns out when I first got to that core realm, I was told, you're not here to stay, you'll be going back. We'll teach you many things. And what happened that was strange was I, a lot of, lot of these kind of lessons that came to me over what seemed to be months, but had to happen within seven Earth days. Uh, occurred in that core realm, but they occurred in, in many different layers of this kind of spiritual journey. And I would tumble back down to that earth where my view. And an interesting thing was I learned early on by remembering the musical notes of the melody. That's what allowed me to conjure up that light portal and get back up into that brilliant uh, ultra real gateway valley. Always welcomed there by the beautiful guardian angel uh, with her same reassuring message witnessing all the beauty and the souls dancing, uh, which I labeled as souls between lives going, to, uh, going on in the meadow below us. Um, but there came a time when I could no longer conjure up that musical melody. To say I was sad at that point would be an understatement, uh, but I knew by that then that I could trust that I would be taken care of by this infinitely loving God force and by that beautiful guardian angel and all the other Kind of forces of golden light in that beautiful uh, gateway valley and in the core realm. Uh, every bit of it was about learning uh, kind of the power of consciousness when liberated from the shackles of the physical brain and body and the material realm. Uh, and it turns out that it was then that I saw these thousands of beings going off into the distance, some holding candles, heads bowed, this murmuring energy coming from them. And when I called that later in my writings, that was the power of prayer. And I found it to be uh, tremendously comforting. So it was very surprising. Here I was, I'd fallen back down to that earth where my view where it all began, could no longer conjure up the beautiful uh, melodies and light portals up in the higher spiritual levels. And yet I was experiencing the same beautiful, loving feeling now with this, this murmuring energy from these thousands of beings. And that's, to me, power of prayer made perfect sense in explaining it weeks later as I was writing it all up. And the last thing that happened in the entire journey uh, was I saw six faces that would kind of come up out of the muck. They'd say a few words and disappear. I can remember those faces as sharply today as if uh, that all happened yesterday, even though it was more than 15 years ago. Uh, and those faces were very important because they, they were faces five of them, five of the six, were physically present uh, in the ICU um, the last tw uh, 24 to 48 hours of coma. And of note, many of the family and friends who had been there earlier in the week, I had no memory of at all. And the reason that was important was it helped me to, to uh, conclude 
that the vast majority of the spiritual journey happened during days one to four, or one to five of, of seven day coma. I explained the timing of all that in the book, Proof of Heaven. But, uh, and those phases were very important. Uh, the last one, probably the most important of all, and that was a face of a 10 year old boy. I didn't recognize him at the time. It was my son, Bond. They had protected Bond from the worst news during that week. Told him daddy's sick, but then of course he goes in and daddy's on a ventilator, unresponsive, in deep coma. Uh, and that Sunday morning, day seven of coma, the doctors had held a family meeting saying I'd gone from 10% chance of survival down to 2%, but with no chance of recovery, uh, given the severe uh, uh, gram negative uh, E. coli bacterial meningoencephalitis with no sign of recovery during uh, a week on three powerful antibiotics on the ventilator. Uh, so it was time to let me go. When Bond heard that, uh-oh, things were much worse mm -hmm. than he had been told. So he came running down the hallway, pulled open my eyelids that had been taped shut, one eye looking over there, one eye over there, neither pupil working. You all know that is a terrible sign of the brain stem being badly damaged. And I promise you, I didn't see him with my eyes or hear him with my ears, but somehow the message got through. He was pleading with me, daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Didn't understand the words. And I had thought through this entire journey that it could continue. It could cease. Didn't matter. My amnesia kind of protected me from any kind of concerns. But now I realized there was another soul out there that needed me very much. And that uh, was probably the most frightening aspect of the whole journey because now things did matter. And yet I didn't have any understanding of things at all. And, um, my higher soul was able to kind of uh, get my way back. I remember coming back to this world of waking up on that ICU bed. Now, turns out, though, that my brain was still very much impacted by the meningitis. So even when I kind of was fighting the ventilator and starting to wake up and they pulled the breathing tube out and I went, thank you. I was still in for about 36 hours of a crazy, paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare, an ICU psychosis. Interestingly enough, the memories of that, which I describe a little bit in the book, Proof of Heaven, uh, faded within about two weeks. And I'm glad I wrote a lot of things down. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any record of them at all. The memories from the deep coma journey, when my brain was completely inactivated, not just by my estimates, but also by those peer reviewers and the physicians who wrote the medical case report, those memories are as sharp and clear today as if the whole thing happened yesterday. And they're very detailed. Uh, and they were very transformational in my life. So one should never assume that near-death experiences are merely dreams or hallucinations or some other kind of nonsense. They are deep and profound lessons about the true nature of our spiritual existence, our uh, functioning as eternal souls. Uh, and I had a full recovery of all my memories uh, within two months of waking up from coma. In fact, some of the personal memories from early childhood events were more clear after the coma than they were before the coma. And that became clear to me in certain discussions with family members, et cetera. We discuss a lot of this about memory and consciousness in our third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, and especially point out that neurosurgeons have pretty much gotten to a conclusion, given the fact that never in more than a century of brain resections has there ever been a removal of any long-term swathe of, of long-term memories, that memories are not stored in the brain. And of course, another very important piece of this whole discussion of mind, brain, and the nature of reality is I didn't realize uh, all the evidence for reincarnation from a scientific perspective uh, before my coma. I'd never studied that. I was, you know, a card-toting reductive materialist. I thought any such talk of childhood memories indicative of reincarnation was nonsense. And yet, when I came back to this world, I knew reincarnation was a huge part of the package. You could not explain any of this if it were just one incarnation, then etern eternal nothingness or heaven, hell, what have you. But it involves multiple incarnations, all in a process of refinement, um, of, of getting closer to that uh, oneness of the divine. It's not about getting off the wheel of suffering, as uh, some interpretations of Buddhism would tell you about reincarnation. So at any rate, uh, I've spent the 15 years since then working with scientists around the world. Um, and this is all about a model that's coming to the scientific community uh, that's uh, uh, really beyond any dispute. We still need to understand much more of how it works, but it puts the mind as primary and the brain as a reducing valve or a filter. Uh, and it allows all of us 
to realize that we're in this together. That's what those life reviews um, and kind of the uh, golden rule that I mentioned a little while ago is all about. We need to learn to get along because the deepest lesson of NDEs is really one of empowering us as spiritual beings bound together through the forces of love, kindness, compassion, mercy, and acceptance when necessary forgiveness. So with that, what I'd like to do is open it up to uh, uh, your uh, further discussion, uh, wherever you'd like to take this, Diana. No, well, thank you so much for that review. And what I heard so much was the theme of like love and love and compassion and how this force, whatever you felt, you know, as you went through your, and the experience was just a, a sense of love and togetherness. And I think that is important to, to, to just emphasize. And also the fact, you know, you, you sort of mentioned it quickly, but, but it's so important that, you know, your chance of survival after a week and, and come after your E. coli meningitis, which is extremely rare to begin with, you know, the chance of survival after seven days was 2%. And of the survival, the recovery would have been, you know, very limited, let's say vegetative state in, in some ways. And the fact just that you recovered fully and that your memory is absolutely outstanding, not just of the events, but just of everything, everything you write, you describe, the people you know, your knowledge at baseline, it's so incredibly much more than anybody, you know, that even didn't go through ND. So, you know, it's so, so powerful to understand just that, you know, that whole experience and that, like you said, with this uh, sense that the brain is where everything is housed. So if it was offline, how can you have these extremely vivid experience you shared, plus the recovery of all this um, memory uh, knowledge, you know, afterwards. So then it cannot physically be housed like we were maybe taught that it's all housed in the brain and it must actually be elsewhere because how can you explain that? And in some ways, you know, maybe we can discuss a little bit you know, if we start thinking, you know, it's not a house in the brain or consciousness, and we are interconnected, and we are part of this grander consciousness and love, you know, I think talking a little bit about the physics and some of the experiments that you discuss in your book about the uh, slit, double slit experiment, even entanglement, what that is, maybe can help people understand, you know, how things change when, you know, we step out and we think about our server and this consciousness, and, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, in one realm. So if you can maybe explain a little bit more of these sure, experiments I'll, I'll... and how that works. I'll do that. And this is uh, for anyone who's interested, uh, certainly living in a mindful universe, we go into great detail about all of this, what's called consilience. Uh, consilience is whenever you look at something of really kind of deep, challenging issue like consciousness, the nature of consciousness. Uh, if you look at it from multiple widely uh, disparate uh, perspectives, and they all give you the same answer, pay attention. So in our book, for example, this consilience uh, is a uh, uh, constructed of neuroscience and what's called the hard problem of consciousness, which is really an impossible problem for materialism as defined by David Chalmers, an Australian uh, philosopher back in the mid-1990s. But then also we deal with philosophy of mind and the, the binding problem, the apparent unity of, a, of consciousness in an individual. It's very difficult to explain how everything that I see, hear, smell, feel, reflect on my memories of past events, executive function, all that is one unified consciousness. It's not like you have all these different neuronal populations chipping in their little two bits. Uh, and that's because consciousness is unified from the get-go. And that's that binding problem in philosophy of mind. Then you get to all the evidence for non-local consciousness out of parapsychology, things like telepathy, um, twin, uh, identical twins, according to uh, um, uh, Guillaume Playfair, he wrote a book called Twin Telepathy, a very good scientific study of telepathy and twins, and he finds that 35% of identical twins have powerful telepathic experiences. One of them can burn their finger on a stove, and the other twin, a thousand miles away, will develop a blister. Now, how in the world does that happen? It happens because that conscious field of consciousness is really a universal field. I would say it's also the same as the uh, quantum uh, zero field, uh, zero uh, fluctuation field. Um, and this is why the, the awarding of the Nobel Prize in Physics for Entanglement 
in the year 2022 is so important because quantum physics is the last of the major uh, elements of this consilience argument because uh, quantum physics has revealed to us the primacy of consciousness for over a century. And that's why the measurement paradox has been so difficult for them to unravel. There are at least 16 of major modern interpretations of the measurement paradox in quantum physics, which has to do with the interaction of the mind of the uh, investigating scientist with uh, you know, the results of the experiment. Uh, and it's really astonishing how all of that work has evolved um, and been so confusing to the materialist scientific community. And yet, when you open your mind to the reality of idealism uh, or to what, where we go, I think, these days with our arguments about idealism, to arguing for evolutionary panentheism. Panentheism is just saying it's not just idealism that this mind is, you know, uh, kind of supervening a, around all that is happening in the physical realm, but it's a group mind. It's that spirit, that kind of God mind that we all share. And that's what becomes apparent from the scientific study, the brain-mind connection and all these relevant uh, fields of quantum physics, neuroscience, philosophy of mind, parapsychology, non-local consciousness. I mean, all of it adds up to a different model and, and what NDEs inform us of is the love, the binding force of love and how that brings healing and wholeness into our lives. So as physicians, we care about taking care of people, about helping them to be better. Uh, and of course there's, you know, physician heal thyself is that uh, first, first rule. And uh, this is where for me, meditation has been so important because um, I, I realized within two years of my coma, I'd read about 150 books trying to understand it all, quantum physics, spiritual books, East and West, et cetera. And I finally realized that I must go within my own mind if I wanted to have any idea what I was talking about. And that demanded a regular pattern of, of meditation. And at that time, about two years post coma, I became aware of a differential frequency brainwave entrainment. That is using slightly different frequencies to the two ears. Uh, and they actually, it ends up, uh, they intersect down in the lower brain stem. And the reason this is important is any kind of chant or anthem of, or hymn you might have ever heard that might have been related to some transcendental state of conscious awareness, those are all processed in the uh, acoustic cortex of the temporal lobes uh, in circuits that have really uh, been derived in the last two or three or four million years in primates and homo sapiens. Very different are the sounds that are interpreted from uh, differential frequency brainwave entrainment, like sacred acoustics. You can go to sacredacoustics.com to learn a lot more. But if you listen through headphones or earbuds, separating the two channels and the slight difference in the frequency, and that slight difference can be anywhere from a fraction of uh, hertz, a cycle per second, up to about 20 to 25 hertz. Beyond that, those, the two uh, parts of the brainstem that are tracing those signals lose track of what they're following. So you can't generate binaural beats of greater than about 20 to 25 hertz. But the good news is our ears can't hear anything under 20 hertz. And you can use these signals to give a very strong oscillating uh, uh, power in the lower brainstem. And I think that's where a lot of the, the real force of this comes from. And the reason people can have such uh, uh, experiences as they do in our workshops. And uh, what I will point out is sacred acoustics uh, has been shown to be very powerful at, uh, for example, alleviating anxiety. There's a peer-reviewed study, Journal of Nerves and Mental Diseases by Dr. Anna Yusim. It came out in January of 2020. Uh, and that was based on a set of frequencies called the Whole Mind Bundle that are available at sacredacoustics.com. The reason I mention that is that that was at the beginning of the pandemic. So when all this happened, and Anna Usum did this study that showed that the patients who listened to sacred acoustics had a 26% reduction in anxiety symptoms over two weeks versus only 7% reduction in patients who got standard talk therapy for anxiety. And this is in a busy Manhattan uh, psychiatric practice. That's a huge benefit from just listening to these tones. Uh, and uh, I know what they're talking about because I've been listening for an hour or two a day for the last 11 years. They're very, very helpful. And certainly relaxation, uh, relief of anxiety is right there in your, in your, uh, within your power. 
by listening to these tones. But of course, they can do so much more as yeah, we should really workshops. Do. Yeah, I do really love them. And I learned about them when I read your book and I downloaded it. And yes, you can get them at sacredacoustics.com. And there's a free download like bundle that has different frequencies. And I would say that, you know, just randomly because I wasn't planning on at all, but I did go to the dentist about two weeks ago. And I am definitely afraid of the dentist, just even for cleaning. They have to know my whole mouth. And it's a very anxiety provoking. And I usually listen to other meditations or music. And this time, for some reason, you know, randomly, quote unquote, you know, I put my uh, my sacred acoustics uh, recording on, and it was just so much different than the last time when I went six months ago. I was so much more calm. I wasn't as anxious. I wasn't as uptight. You know, just during that, you know, twenty minutes that I listened to. So. That's just one session. And, you know, obviously if you do it in more daily practice, you may see a lot of different, you know, effects or increased intuition, like an anxiety, help you sleep. And what I do like for some people that maybe meditation sitting, you know, is difficult uh, or they haven't tried other practices, you can lay down, you don't have to be sitting up and it could be, you know, getting you in those states of mind um, that, you know, changes your brainwave pattern to a more, again, relaxed um, less anxious state. So I do think for those that don't know about it, they could really be a tool that can be very helpful if maybe other meditation tools or other practices, whether it's, you know, tapping or other things that you use, you know, it being your armamentum of, of things to do. So I did want to sort of share that, you know, even a one-time regular practice can still have the benefits and it could be helpful. Well, Diana, thank you so much for sharing that. And that's a beautiful observation about you're using it for trips to the dentist and other anxiety provoking events. We've heard of uh, examples of addiction specialists uh, in Florida and Utah and other places around the country using sacred acoustics in some of their patients who come in, especially when they're in the throes of, of withdrawal, say from opiates, things like that. Uh, where these doctors will put headphones on these people and play that alm file from sacred acoustics and literally within five or 10 minutes, much more mellowed out. So they can be very effective at calming people in the throes of you know, drug uh, addiction, withdrawal, et cetera. Uh, in fact, I think one of the main uh, reasons for using this will be to treat addictions in the future. Um, I know that there's uh, some beautiful work that's been done by Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins, where they use psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and they showed that one dose uh, was able to give an 80% reduction in fear of death in terminal cancer patients, and also 80% uh, uh, reduction in addiction potential in uh, opiates, nicotine, alcohol. So, And that's with the one dose of psilocybin. Now, the point I'm trying to make is I believe, and we're, we'll be constructing a study to evaluate this, but I think that sacred acoustics, by giving you that thinning of the veil, that connection with that higher soul, which is exactly what that uh, uh, psychedelic substance is doing, uh, that you could do it without the substance. Um, so meditation alone with sacred acoustics, I think will we'll have the power to do this. And we've seen uh, a lot of such benefit in our uh, workshop population, and also in, in uh, Karen's testimonials, if you go to sacredacoustics.com, you'll find a lot of testimonials uh, uh, making those points about uh, the benefits of sacred acoustics. And as I said earlier, that uh, if you go to sacredacoustics.com and look for the whole mind bundle, it's available at a, a, a discount. Karen put a huge discount on it back at the beginning of the pandemic, and that included a free option. The reason she wanted to include it for free was she knew that uh, anxiety was going to be gigantic in the in the uh, pandemic as it was with the economic shutdowns, et cetera. Uh, and she is still giving that one away for anybody who uh, has the financial uh, uh, restrictions that they can't really afford it. I think $19 is the price uh, if you buy it on the site, which is an amazingly good price for what you're getting anyway. But to give it away for free, I think just shows her uh, her beautiful heart and um, her willingness to help people, you know, around the world with these kinds of problems. But I've found sacred acoustics to be incredibly valuable uh, in my own kind of healing and wholeness in my uh, working with, on healing with, uh, you know, with other people. With uh, I'm no longer practicing as a neurosurgeon, uh, but um, I use meditation a lot and in, 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 as a form of centering prayer to help uh, 
patients and the family and the other friends and what have you to come into healing and wholeness in their own lives. Yeah, I love that. And, um, you know, obviously the audience here is a lot of physicians and, you know, many who, whether they're in burnout or not, or just want to stay in wellness, you know, forget being in burnout, but just want to continue a life, a path of wellness. You know, you mentioned going within meditation, you know, has been something very helpful and the, the acoustic sounds, the manure beats are, are very helpful. Are there other tools that you have found that were helpful or you can share for others that can help others in this path of wellness? Or connection well, to the well, I think an overall education about uh, kind of many of the things I've been talking about. You know, I'd say there's a scientific revolution around this understanding of the one mind and that we all share that mind and we're all bound together through these forces of love. Well, what you know, what evidence beyond my personal experience do I have? It turns out that there is a beautiful uh, uh, repository of essays that were written two years ago. Uh, in a contest. It was held by Robert Bigelow, who's an aerospace engineer in Las Vegas, and he had lost his wife. His son had committed suicide. He was wondering, is there any real scientific evidence that their souls are still here? So he put the question out to the scientific community and said, what's the best scientific evidence uh, for continuation of conscious awareness after permanent bodily death? And uh, with that question, there was a stipulation that you had to demonstrate at least five years of rigorous scientific investigative work looking at that question of the afterlife before you could even submit an essay. In that setting, they had more than a thousand people interested. They received 204 essays. Originally, we're going to give out uh, three monetary prizes. Well, the essays were so good, they gave out 28 monetary prizes. And all 28 essays are available today to the reading public uh, for free, bigelowinstitute.org. Go to that website. Uh, you can start with Jeffrey Mishlov's first place essay, and you'll quickly realize that the science on this is already settled. Of course, there's an afterlife, and you'll even find a lot of evidence in there for reincarnation. Uh, a lot of that is based on the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, uh, who have been investigating uh, past life memories in children for the last uh, six or seven decades. They've studied more than 2,700 cases of which 1,700 are what they call solved. That is, they actually found the person that the child is describing. Now, of course, many children can claim to have past lives, but we hear that and most, most of us in our culture just say, well, it's nonsense because there's no such thing as reincarnation. Well, just so happens when you study them, scientifically, you find that there are a lot of real cases of reincarnation. So it's a very real part of this, uh, this world I'm talking about. Now, some people get all worried that their loved one might have already reincarnated before they pass over and they want their loved ones to be there. Well, I can assure you that given the uh, uh, what, if you pay attention to what I'm saying about the, the nature of those life reviews, uh, uh, in near-death experiences, that people are reliving events of uh, all through their life and past lives and future lives, it shows you how much that realm enables our conscious awareness to come into deeper knowing of kind of our soul journey. Uh, and that, to me, is uh, well worth paying attention to. But these essays are absolutely astonishing at BigelowInstitute.org. Uh, you start reading them, you'll never doubt again the reality of the afterlife and of reincarnation. And yet, scientifically, we need better models to explain it all. Um, that's where we try to go in Living in a Mindful Universe. In fact, we're working on another book now. Uh, and I would say that uh, certain scientific groups are making progress. There are two groups that I work with in particular. I can recommend people go to uh, uh, scientificandmedical.net. GalileoCommission.org. Those two sites. Uh, I'm on the scientific advisory board for both. You, you go there, read their manifestos, you'll realize that a lot of work is being done and a lot of progress being made uh, in showing this primacy of, of mind. And, and basically, it, it gives us much more power over what we see as our role in uh, navigating uh, this lifetime. So that whereas the materialist science that I worship before my coma might have tried to tell you that we don't even have free will. They would say it's just chemical reactions, electron fluxes in the brain. Uh, there's uh, that, that anything that we have as a sense of free will is an illusion, that our very consciousness is an illusion. 
but I would say that they have it back bass backwards, <laughs> the whole thing, because mind is actually primary. Uh, and that's where all this is going. That's where the awarding of entanglement uh, for the Nobel Prize in 2022 is so important. And there are certainly other papers in that BigelowInstitute.org set of essays that are that have a very strong scientific bent for those of you who are absolutely demanding of the purest of science in any of this. They're all very strong papers, not to put any of them down, uh, but in particular, the paper by Dean Radin, the second place winner by Dr. Pim Van Lommel, um, the one by Bernardo Kastrup. These are all excellent essays that really kind of cover from multiple different directions the reality of this notion of primacy of mind and how the brain is merely a filter allowing an expression of consciousness, but that our very soul is not dependent on the brain and body for its existence and comes into a much higher knowing uh, by being liberated from the shackles of the brain and body. And this is where centering prayer and meditation can be so valuable uh, because you don't have to have a near-death experience to come to know everything I know about the reality of that afterlife if you simply follow a regular program of meditation, of going within, of becoming that observer. Yeah. And uh, that's where I think all this can uh, really expand for all of us. Yeah, I think when you step back, and it maybe goes a little bit to a question that's been asked, is that I'm curious, it seems like our true nature is love. However, what is the role of the ego, attachment to identity, shadow side, the character, difficulties, flaws, defaults? So I think, you know, when we uh, get attached to our ego, like that we are our bodies, we are our thoughts, and we don't, re we start to realize when we go within, when we get quiet in meditation or any other process you use, that we are not our thoughts, we are not our bodies, and the I, you know, is not the false ego. The, the I am is truly the, that soul that is right. separate from that, that the soul uses the body, the emotions, the actions to, you know, grow or evolve in, in this lifetime or next. I mean, I think that's sort of the purpose of, of this life. Maybe you obviously have a better understanding, but the purpose is that evolution and growth. And we are using this life school on here uh, on earth to learn these lessons to evolve. But, you know, we get so entangled with our identity, that false ego, that we believe the I is this body, the I is these thoughts um, that are our identity, that I'm angry, but the I am is not angry. The I am is love. You know, as right. you mentioned multiple times over and over, is this grander love, but we can entangle that I'm angry, I'm this, I'm a mom. You know, those are the false ego, I think, coming in. And I think when we don't cultivate that practice of quieting down, then we don't, uh, we don't remember. And I think it's about remembering who we are in those practices. Maybe in NDEs as well, obviously it was clearly shown, told, you know, you're worthy, you're love, you'll be okay. I mean, you were told that during those experiences, but if you're not, maybe lucky or not lucky to have that, I think that prayer time, the meditation, are those opportunities for everybody else perhaps to really remember that. So I don't know if you have you know, more to say on the ego and the false well, certainly, I think the ego, you know, it does serve a purpose. I mean, it kind of protects uh, the self, the body, et cetera, but it is not your ally in these deep and profound spiritual journeys, especially when it comes to understanding meaning and purpose and kind of our relationship to the universe at large and our relationship to our fellow beings. The ego simply gets in the way. Uh, it's a real problem child often. Uh, and I would say the ego is right at the heart of addictions. Uh, it's right at the heart of you know, debilitating fear of death. That's why it's so interesting how Roland Griffiths showed a single dose of psilocybin to have such long lasting uh, relief of such ego toxic conditions as addictions and fear of death. Um, but I think uh, that humanity is at a point now where uh, we are starting to evolve beyond kind of the ego and its uh, uh, dictation of things, especially when you witness all the damage that um, narcissism and kind of uh, egotistical behavior, especially on the, on the behalf of major national leaders, how dangerous that can be to the world at large. And that's where we get the madness of our current era with the polarization, uh, with threats of nuclear war, things like that. I mean, uh, 
as this kind of awakening that I'm talking about takes hold, uh, humankind will have nothing to do but dispose of those nuclear weapons and warfare, uh, because we're all truly in, th in this together and to hurt another is to hurt oneself. That's crystal clear from the life reviews of near-death experiences by the millions out there in this world. So it's uh, about moving beyond the bleak and paltry fiction of materialism that pretends our existence is birth to death and nothing more, that we're just these meat robots, that we don't even truly have free will, it's chemical reactions and electron fluxes, whereas all of that is a false narrative. And this grander narrative of the primacy of mind and of consciousness and the binding force of love is one that can be tremendously liberating for all of us. Now, in all that discussion of the reincarnation literature, what I didn't mention is something called programmed forgetting. And that is the doctors who have studied these cases, uh, Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker are the two at University of Virginia who have done this work over the last six decades, will tell you, if you want to harvest these memories, you must do so before age six or seven, because they're natural processes that cover them over so that most of us by our teen years have no memories of between lives or past lives. We just buy into this existence and this lifetime. But you can uncover past lives through near-death experiences, through hypnotic regression, through meditation. There are many different ways to uncover uh, the elements of our past lives, which can come in very handy as the world of transpersonal psychology has shown us in dealing with the issues of this lifetime. It's mm -hmm. what Ian Stevenson, who was uh, uh, the head of psychiatry at UVA back in the 1960s, called the tertium quid. That is, they were used to nature and nurture, you know, DNA, your nature, uh, nurture your upbringing by your parents. And that was what they thought formed the personality. And what Ian Stevenson said, yes, you've got nature and nurture, and you have this third pathway. That is, that people have had previous lifetimes, and that has given them problems and also taught them things that allow them to have a whole new set of issues in this lifetime, but they're rooted in the issues of prior lifetimes. So going into meditation, as I've done many a time to try and recover that kind of thing, can be helpful uh, at uh, kind of filling out our sense of who we are and how we are best to interact with our fellow beings and to see ourselves as having meaning and purpose in the universe at large. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes back to, you know, the which is in many, you know, faiths of religions, you know, you reap what you sow, what you plant, you get that seed, and there's a lot of karma, you know, and it may not be in this lifetime, but whatever you do unto others will come back to you. And it, it, it's a good thing to follow because you want to do good for others. You want to be in that loving state because you know that what you do will come back to you. And so when we understand that, in the grander sense, and you're right, we are not going to be fighting and be mean to others and hurtful because it will come back. So we want to move to that other state of love, of compassion, forgiveness, that is, you know, not only going to reap those benefits at some point, but even in that moment where our state, you know, to the cellular level is going to be a different state of wellness and healing when we're in a state of love that when we're in a state of anger and stress and cortisol and we're in our own you know, physical disease at that moment or later. So I think it's so important when we, again, start stepping behind that ego and remembering our true self, remembering these laws of the universe, of love, of karma, um, that can really hopefully change the way we see our everyday interaction. And also that we see that everybody we interact with is really there you know, to teach us something, you know, whether that person that triggered us or the person we love, there's really something to learn from that and to evolve from that interaction so that we can evolve and we can get to a, to a better place as a whole again. But again, well, we have to think about that. Yeah, I, I certainly came back from my near-death experience realizing that the challenges in life, the hurdles and difficulties, illness, injury, these are gifts. And the more I came to embrace them as gifts and realize they were kind of stepping stones that marked a pathway forward. And I would say, uh, in many ways, I believe this notion of a soul agreement, that as soul groups, that we, we plan the challenges and difficulties we'll face in a given incarnation. That comes after going through life reviews and deciding what are the lessons for the soul group to uh, you know, put, uh, put before itself. Uh, to uh, 
to lead to a certain kind of learning. And, uh, and that is exactly what I see unfolding in these kinds of uh, uh, this bigger picture. And the other side of that is when I find someone in my life who uh, before my coma, I might've seen as an enemy or a nemesis, someone who was in the way of things I wanted. I now, since my coma, have come to take on as a near and dear soul mate that we were trying we we're trying to teach each other especially challenging lessons. That's why I have trouble with them. They have trouble with me. But it's all about learning to rise above that, to grow from the experience, to seek the highest good for all involved, and the one that best expresses that unconditional love of the creator for the creation that we can all share as co-creators of our emerging reality. Uh, but that it's all truly about that love and recovering that sense of love the universe has for us. And this is a way of getting to that state of all is well. You know, as you come to realize the sting of death disappears as one explores in meditation and centering prayer more and more to realize that their consciousness is not something that is only there with the brain and body intact, but in many ways can go far beyond uh, you know, the mind imprisoned in the body. Uh, and that's where meditation and a, a regular practice of it, I think, can be so beneficial. Because over time, I know that my life, my function, uh, my mental abilities, my sense of comfort with the world, uh, my sense of achievement in, in doing things that help the higher good, that, that helped other beings and delivered on that love, uh, all of that builds towards my growth as a soul. And uh, this is where I think all of us can benefit uh, by sharing this and realizing uh, that our free will is very active at determining, you know, how our reality unfolds. But it, it has to do with facing up to those hardships and challenges and realize in many ways that they can be gifts uh, to uh, help us uh, get on a, a, a beautiful pathway of growth. Uh, I would say all of this is really the evolution of consciousness itself. As Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote in his book, The Phenomenon of Man, back in the mid 20th century, he was a French uh, uh, Jesuit priest. So he had a spiritual background, but he was also a paleontologist. So he was a scientist looking at billion year timescales. And in that book, he makes the beautiful case that, yes, there's an evolution going on. There was a lot of discussion about Darwinian evolution in the mid 20th century, but he said it goes far beyond that. All of consciousness throughout the cosmos is in the process of evolving. And I would say that just like that old saying, all politics is local, uh, all evolution of consciousness throughout the cosmos is nothing more than individual sentient beings coming to a deeper understanding of their shared role and purpose with the universe at large. Absolutely. And I think for physicians, you know, that may be struggling, they're in a difficult place, you know, whether in burnout, I think that could be definitely an invitation itself to go into these deeper you know, um, asking and, and wondering curiosity of, you know, what is my purpose, aligning yourself with that purpose. And and, and burnout can be one. And obviously a near-death experience or having a loved one, you know, tragically die or things like that, or a tragic or a diagnosis of cancer, that really is a stop sign to stop and pause and really kind of dive into this and think about it. And it can be a gift to to start that exploration. So I, I want to be mindful of your time. I mean, I could probably speak and people could hear you for hours, just so much to to really, really think about and, and use in their daily life to, again, align ourselves with a purpose, to realize this grander consciousness and the whole, whole fabric, which is love. Um, and then I'll just answer this quick question. Can I ask, is it possible to have a near-death experience without remembering the event and at the same time experiencing possible after effects like not fearing death, having glimpses of memories and going dreams for those who have, who have passed. So maybe yes, you can just I've, answer this I've, one. I've heard that pattern occur multiple times where people would have, you know, some illness, some accident, some thing that challenged their life. And they came back from it and said, well, I don't remember anything happening, but I've changed in some way. So you often find people uh, get an increase in intuition, et cetera. This is especially common in very, very young children who have a health challenge. Uh, they can have a profound near-death experience and yet not have memories of it. Uh, and yet they, it can all come back later through meditation, through hypnotic regression, through another NDE. People will often then have memories of what happened during the first one that they didn't remember after the first event, but they remember after the second event. 
So it's important to keep a very open mind about these things and the way that they present to us. And also remember that if you ask the universe for help, you often get it. So in, in prayer and meditation, asking for help uh, often will result in, in something that's very satisfying. So I would encourage people to do that. And also I would just uh, say people can learn more about me at eben, E-B-E-N, alexander.com, uh, especially the re recommended reading list, the FAQ page for a, a lot of issues that are important to people, uh, and also listings of, of presentations and conferences, et cetera. Uh, videos, all that stuff there, evanalexander.com, also the books, especially Living in Mindful Universe, all of it is uh, right there. And there's a 33-day journey in the heart of consciousness right on my entry page. And join that up and you get a workbook for free that's part of that Living in the Mindful Universe and the email drip campaign where every 33 days you'll get a major concept from that book. And then you'll find that there are more than 12,000 people around the world who have already taken that 33-day journey and left their comments and they help each other, et cetera. So big community forming up there. And the only other thing is um, go to, um, sorry, it's um, Sacred Acoustics? Sacred Acoustics? Or uh, Sacredacoustics.com, <laughs> absolutely for the meditation. And there's a lot there, just explore the site. You'll learn a tremendous amount. Like I said earlier, look for that whole mind bundle. Um, and then the, the last site I wanted to mention is innersanctumcenter.com, I-N-N-E-R sanctumcenter.com. And there are many offerings there. There's a, a health mental health practitioner course that we did with Dr. Anna Yusum. It's available there. There's also a set of uh, uh, webinars we did every two weeks during two years of the pandemic, uh, interviews with uh, thought leaders around the world on consciousness, as well as other experiencers, et cetera. All that is uh, there at innersanctumcenter.com. And also, we have a monthly uh, webinar with uh, fans that's available at innersanctumcenter.com. So I highly okay. recommend people explore that, evanalexander.com and sacredacoustics.com. And you can learn a lot more about all of this. Yeah, so many resources. And I do want to end on that amazing last thought like you know ask for help help will come if you ask and i think it, it's important especially for physicians who don't ever want to ask for help and i right. remember that was the last thing you said before you went into your coma you said god help me so right. so powerful to ask for help whether it's divine guides spiritual guides you know that greater universe you know sometimes when you feel lost you don't know what your next step is just asking and sitting in that stillness to receive that message you know, maybe so important. So if you are in a tough place, maybe today the sign is to get still, get quiet and ask for that guidance, you know, for your next step. So thank, thank you again so much, everybody, for being here. This has been such a delight. Please, uh, we'll put all the show notes uh, of all these resources you mentioned and how to get in contact with your resources, your webinars that you do and your community. And uh, thank you again for everybody being here. Every month we will have a physician here speaking about topics uh, that could help all of us in any part of our life. And check it out at physiciancoachsupport.com, all our past ones as well that hopefully can help you and guide you. And if you're a physician or know a physician that could get some support, please feel free to check it out. It's free and confidential. And thank you so much for everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Diana, for everything you do.